Ha, na ha mat na minewak, na tano e makanuk, mishik mao ni wia ke hio sa ito, wai wanin ke tana ni mua, a nets kais piataya e hio spos na watch ka kikitea, and then why keeps our say to we are I am kita say na say when talk to Hiope, ne got to cochet them, ke wait to mua, and eat a kaisa say to you and ask Mac Pumata say and and this will mat na mine, okay. Yope, ne got to wap, pos ke wait to mua, wan it you all in, I ya. Ne net I all in, mooks awkward. O mat na mine, ne tow him. A minica ho mat no mine, okay, ne wap yum. A ninica skiwa ear has mac pimatus here, ne peach ke hawak, he ha come ne nichi anesuk, ne ane nichi anak and tart no wak. Wuna up no ne matamosim, I ha ha say, sa. Na hauta he no, nat to mosian, or meo so square, hope he mortit, tart no ne kut ne tarn, I ha wats a chewin. Ne kits chi nana kwat wuna up no ne tan aya mat ne kwa kuki and ota ne kut na nima awiaki wuna up mini and oh ne kut no se sa n tat no wuna te hayawit poekone Yope te hasis ne kikitim ayom ne tachimun as mat ke kinamun yum ne ta seit ne sewen nots te hayom kako ne waitamun Kina up ni kina to moin, and eat us a weeky tea and push your pee tomaka, get that Satan to say when, and then a cock keep on mart to say. So I want to start out that way, tell you guys a little bit about who I am and where I come from, and um, you know, mostly that I'm excited to be here to share a little bit about my story. Um, but mainly I shared with you um, my introduction and kind of set up my talk a little bit. Um, I wanted to let you all know that my name is Mutsakwit, or Clear Sky, and that wherever I go, I like to talk about my family. You know, I got a rather large family. I've got um, five children, keep me busy all the time, and recently I've also been blessed with my first grandchild, and that's a, that's a whole new way of thinking about life. So um, I wanted to start out like that. Um, I'm real proud of everyone for coming out here and showing up and and I'm um, thinking that much of your language to come out and try to learn something and hopefully you know the things that are said here are there's something you can take home to get over that next hurdle. So with that, you know I get a little nervous up here and, and it's not because I'm afraid to talk in front of you, it's because I really want to say something that, that helps people, you know, that encourages you guys in your struggles and your fight and so um, it's really nice to be accompanied by my elders. That's why I like to put them up there. Um, I was asked to come here and share a little bit about my story, my journey, how I got here today. Uh, when I was starting out learning the language, uh, it was like me, <laughs> you know? I was like this young guy that the elders couldn't get rid of. So. So it was kind of awkward because uh, because there was nobody else doing this in my community, and I couldn't understand why why this was happening to me. But when I um, when I processed through it, I came up with this this sort of PowerPoint to help me talk through this stuff. So I think I just pushed the button on here, and it helps me out here. Right? Okay. All right, so I want to talk about my story. And <clears throat> I think about my, my early dreams. Um, in, in my life, I was born and raised on the Menominee Reservation in Wisconsin. And, and uh, as life would have it, my father, he, he received a, a fellowship to attend a university a couple hours away from my reserve. And, uh, I was six years old at that time, and I can remember uh, putting up the argument with them that I couldn't leave because I had to learn my language and I had to learn to sing. That's what I can remember telling them at six years old, and 
And, uh, you know, even later on, my mother telling me, you know, I, I, couldn't, I can't understand where that comes from, you know. And so for me, I know that in my own, my own story, when I was that small, for some reason, I was, I was given these, these dreams, and these dreams, they put me in, a, in sort of like the old villages, and I don't, I don't really think of these dreams as sacred or spiritual, but and in essence, they were showing me something I, I didn't realize existed in my current day. And so it was those things that I longed for, and I can't even remember being afraid, you know. I can remember being in these dreams of these old villages when everyone was talking a language that I had never heard and doing things I'd never seen. And I would wake up and I would be scared, you know. I'd go wake up my father and tell him, you know, I'm, I'm having these dreams. And, you know, I'd be crying and, and he'd be... He'd be reassuring me, you know, don't worry, though. that's good. That's good when you're there, pay attention, you know. And so I can only think that those dreams were, were creating in my, my mind that this, this was out there because I didn't see it in the modern day. And so um, based on those, those things, you know, it, it actually, as it turned out, I wound up uh, being diagnosed with LWS at a pretty young age, you know, and, um, for those of you that don't know, that's language warrior syndrome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of time that, that seems like a gift, and, but there's also a lot of time that it's, it's quite a heavy burden, you know. So um, we, take, we take the good with the, with the challenges and, um, you know, for whatever reason, man, I, my, my path had always led me in a, in a direction that kept this prominent in my life. So even though I had relocated to this, this town uh, about an hour and a half from my reserve, where there was no language exposure, for some reason, it was right at that time that a, that a man from my reservation, an elder man, was asked to teach Menominee language at that same university at the same time I was there. And um, by rule, he would come through and he would stop at our house when he was in town and then he would be sitting at the table speaking with my father. And um, my father didn't speak to language. He'd just be, you know, they'd be having casual conversation, whatever. And as this was happening, he started to teach us some words, my brother and myself. And um, pretty soon, the word started to stick, and, and uh, he started to say, tell my dad, you know, I think this guy, I think he can learn this language, you know. And I'm about nine or ten at that time, and um, this, is, this is that time, so, and that's that elder. And with, with his kind teachings and, and um, his guidance, even being miles away from my homeland and not having that connection for some reason it was brought to me or or it worked out so um in that way i i really had a i really couldn't question it you know i'm, I'm a little kid but I, I took to that language like you wouldn't believe and so i was there about two years in this situation where this this elder would come and uh, visit my house and teach me words and tell us little stories and stuff like that and after those two years, we moved back home. And so then I'm about 12 at that time, we moved back home and um, I'm, really, I'm really proud of, you know, th this language that I've been able to learn, these stories that have been told to me. And uh, I come home and, you know, to my surprise, not everyone feels the same way. Of course, I'm 12 and 13 and asking, you know, my cousins and my neighbors, if they knew any of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, it was about then that, that I got introduced to, to all the BS, you know? And, and the way I think about that, I think about that as a beautiful struggle, you know? And uh, so in that beautiful struggle, man, there's, there's many teachings. I mean, you know, I can't count the times that I, that I question myself and what I was doing, and especially because of that, that lateral oppression that, you know, think you're better than us, you know, or, you know, and you're just trying to be you, you know, trying to live out who, who I was um, trying to be, trying to learn our language, learn to sing, 
learn our cultural activities and and to experience that lateral, lateral oppression, man, it's, it's a lot easier and a lot of people really do. Instead of taking that lead, lead role, they step back and they wanna, they wanna blend in. They don't, they don't wanna be um, put in that situation to deal with that scrutiny. And so it takes a, takes a person that's got language warrior syndrome to actually, to actually you know, take that lead. And, and I, I don't mean that in any kind of gloating way, man, because I don't, I don't look down on anyone who doesn't step into that light because it can be kind of difficult to, to stand up in your community and be that, that kind of person because people, they, they really want to remember the worst things about you when you start to do really well, right? And so um, the easiest way to avoid anyone remembering that stuff is just to step back and be a part of that team tossing things in, you know? Um, so I, I wanted to make sure and say that, and, and I really... I want to talk about this idea of taking things like BS and right away what it brought up in your mind um, and turning it into something like beautiful struggle, you know. It's something that I really embraced in my teaching back home. Um, and, and I got, I, <laughs> I really had to reevaluate the way I was doing things because if you guys are teaching your language wherever you're at, your language is probably more complicated than English. And... It's probably really difficult to learn because of several things. And so as an instructor, I was always really sure to tell my students just how difficult the language was gonna be to learn. Um, and so if it wasn't already hard enough, now they've got this in their head that, oh my God, this language is so hard to learn and oh my God, barely anyone speaks it. Oh my God, as soon as I start doing well, everyone's gonna judge me. And, so, and all I was doing was reinforcing that, you know? And so I, I got on uh, to this thing of, of kind of trying to just change that dynamic a little bit. And so at a point where I would normally tell my students, you know, learning this language is gonna be the most difficult thing you've ever done. And, you know, maybe if you work really hard for your whole life, you might learn a little bit about it. I got to actually where I, you know, and it's just a mental thing, it's like, it's like uh, learning this language is fun and easy. That's what I say. Every time learning my language gets really difficult for my learners or we introduce some new grammatical pattern and it pulls the rug out from everything they thought they knew already, hey, don't forget, I, I'm always telling you guys that learning this language is fun and easy. And it's just this little thing that changes that tempo of instead of saying, I told you this was going to be hard, you know, and... And so it's just that little mental shift, man, it goes a long way, so I wanted to make sure and mention that. All right, there she goes, my adopted mother. When I moved back to the reservation, I, I was pretty quickly taken under this lady's wing, man, and uh, she, she is my everything, you know? Um, she mean, means the world to me. And especially at that time when I moved back to the reservation from being away, you know, that in and of itself was tough because you enter that reservation school at eighth grade and all of a sudden you're the city boy and you're, you know, this and that. And it was hard, man. It was tough. And this was a person who singled me out because I was trying with the language and, you know, Put, put her wings around me and, and made me feel good about everything I was doing. So um, I, I really owe everything to this lady. Watsachiwan is what, what we call her. Um, she passed away a little while ago, but, but that's, that's my everything right there. <clears throat> oh. All right, and so I'm fortunate enough to be, uh, to be um, like as young as I could be with, with still having been taught by our elders and, and having that system there. Um, and so I consider myself very lucky. And when we were asked to do these, they put together some, some guiding themes that, that we, we should talk about. And so a lot of these things I want to talk about and, and show my elders and think about a thing that they were able to tell me that helped me 
that I still think about today. So, This lady here, her name is Wapachiwan. Wapachiwan Kahnup and um, you know, she, she, was, uh, she was a tribal judge, man, and, and she was very straight-laced, and I was afraid of her sense of humor even, you know, and she had a, she had a thing, and maybe some of you second language learners can relate to this. Uh, the, the lady I just showed and all my love and my heart, and this lady, they, they weren't very fr friendly to one another, and, and uh, so there was a time when I started to learn, you know, from this, this lady, and I was just meeting her, and I was asking her how to say things, and immediately she says, well, doesn't Lillian teach you this stuff? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I says, you know, but, but I, wanna, I wanna hear the way that you, you say it too, you know, and so just with that little shift, man, she really changed, and she really started to help me, and at some point in my, in my younger years, you know, we, we really embrace this story back home as Menominee people that, that we don't have a migration story and we never moved and our land has always been our land. And, and, and it's true and, it's, and that's a great story and I like it, but I couldn't then wrap my mind around how, we, how did we lose everything, you know? If, we, if we're right here in the same territory forever, how did we, how did we lose this all? And so one day, I was naive enough to, to ask this lady Wapachiwan that question, you know, how did this happen to us? And she says, uh, she says, oh, she says, um, you, you could never understand. She said, I'm going to tell you what, she said, just be proud. It's really something in my life that I get to see our youth coming up proud of their language and culture. And, uh, she, she shared with me a, an experience from her earlier life and she was really trying to help me to understand what they endured. And she says, um, you know, I, I don't really know how to explain it to you, but she says, I, I wanna tell you that, you know, when I was young, she said, I used to look in the mirror and I used to think, you know, why me? Why was I born an Indian? You know, what did I ever do wrong to anybody? That's the way she was raised to feel about who she was, you know? And so for her to know this young man who all I know is pride, you know, I don't have that, that about me. And uh, she, she really wanted me to embrace that. And she said, you know, I'm gonna tell you this, she said, and not, not because I'm proud of it, but to help you understand. She said, one time I was in the, in the store in the town next to the reservation with my mother. And uh, my mother, she was looking at different things and she grabbed something off the shelf and she turned to me and she says uh, you know which in our language it means how much is this and she said I was so embarrassed that my mother would speak to me like that in public that I walked by her like I didn't even know her and uh, you know that that helps me to understand what what this lady went through in her life. Um, and, so, and so sometimes as bad as we have it today, man, at least we're, we're raised to be proud in this generation. I want you guys to carry that with you. Make sure your children feel proud to be who they are uh, as Indian people, wherever you might be from. <clears throat> The, the shorter lady in this photograph, her name is Sawanuki. Sawanuki Kahnup, and she was another one of our big motivators and teachers. And, and you know, she was, uh, man, she came to everything. She was that elder. She was there at everything. You need my help, I'll be there, man. And she, <laughs> she was always five or 10 minutes late, but she was going to be there, you know. And... She did so much, she did so much to help us um, that I remember one time, and again, man, I'm young and naive at this time, so don't judge me. <laughs> but, you know, I had the audacity to ask her uh, one day sitting with her, you know, I was like, Sawanuki, you know, you do so much to help us today. So much, you're at everything. Um, you know, it makes me wonder why, why you didn't 
teach your own children, you know. She had a, a lot of children. And, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a humble way, you know, she said, you know what, Ron, she said, I never thought it would come to this. I never thought it would come to this. She said, when I was a kid, everybody spoke our language. I could never imagine that I would be one of the last speakers of our language. She said, it never even crossed my mind. So some of you guys might be from communities where you were raised in a place that everybody spoke in your generation. And just think about this lady's last years um, identifying as, as one of the last speakers of her language. Um, don't take that for granted, man. Give that gift. Give that gift to someone who, who's going to do good things with it. And back to, back to the boss lady here. Uh, I get a little emotional talking about her, so this is, this is kind of tough for me. But, you know, there was a certain time when she was starting to get ill that uh, she started to suffer from dementia later in life. And, and uh, she was still at home at this time. I was visiting her in her house. And... Uh, we're, we're talking, we're talking Menominee, you know, and, and um, she all of a sudden just interrupts the entire conversation and, and she, she looks at me and she says, you know what? She says, I can die now. That's what she told me. And, and it was like, you know, we were talking about, you know, whatever. And then she comes across and she says this and it really caught me off guard. And I said, well, you know, what do you? So I asked Kalkiki to you, and you know, what are you, what are you talking about? And she said, uh, you know, for 25 years, she said, I, I try to teach someone this language. She said, and now, now today, I've done that. That's what she told me. And she says, Kanopach Kitchenania and Asawi and Nipe Kinotawawak Nichi Anuks Kalkiki to you. She said, Ponini Tahua. You know, she says, uh, maybe, maybe you're going to be an old man when you hear our children speak in this language again. She says, don't give up. I love you, you know. <laughs> I'll share that about the boss lady. Ah. And here's Nipanita. Without who's... Uh, Without who's, uh, I don't know what to call it. I'll put it like this. Um, you know, I had been making a glorious mess of my language for years, man. But I think the elders, they were so happy to be talking to someone young in the language that they didn't have the heart to tell me I was screwing it all up, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so if they could understand me, they would just answer. And they, they never had the heart to tell me any different. And... Uh, this guy, he was the one, man, and in a simple phrase, you know, I, I, I went to his house to pick him up. We were going to go riding in the woods, and, and uh, you know, he had a bad knee, so it took him a little while to get ready. I knocked on the door. I knew I was going to be waiting a little bit. And so when he came out, I says, ah, coach, sickney, keep him, you know, paupiho, you know, kinesni, paupiho. And he, and then he, and in that little phrase, he says, you know, there's a better way of saying that. <laughs> and I said, all right, you know, tell me. So he, he tells me, you know, you should say, and then, so that day I told him, well, anytime I make a mistake, man, let me know because I want to get better. <laughs> that was a long day. <laughs> that was a long day, man. Um, you know, but without, without that... I, maybe I never would have crossed into to getting better. Everyone was happy with what I knew. Um, so even though it was criticism, we as second language learners, as language warriors, have to learn to accept that criticism. Don't let it destroy you. We've got to get better always, you know. So I thank Nipanita for, for that. Oh... Here's the two ladies, man. Uh, these two just really inspired me. These are a pair of sisters. Um, Kata, what's her name? 
Musakatuki and her sister Kekewahuniaki. And these two, they were speaking language everywhere they went all the time, unapologetically, um, and became some of my heroes, man. Because in, in 1997, back home, we hit some uh, bumpy roads, so to speak, and we, ha we, ha we have our own public school district there, all within our reservation, and it's nearly 100% Native American student body and they were proposing, the, the non-native superintendent was proposing to take Menominee language out of the schools. And, you know, I really, today I really thank him for that because that woke a lot of the sleeping people up, man, because if it was always just business as usual, we probably never would have had this shakeup. But because of this, there was initiated many meetings, you know, all over the place to talk about. We can't let this happen. And you know, so people that were sitting idle for a long time, all of a sudden they're up and they, they want to get in and they want to, you know, put their two cents in. So anyway, we had a legislative meeting back home and um, it was all about this language in the schools being taken away. And these two ladies, these two ladies, emerged as my heroes, man. I went there with my adopted mother and we sat right behind them. And they, <laughs> they were ex definitely letting their distaste to the subject content known all in the language. And you could tell by the intonation that they weren't exchanging pleasantries, you know? And, and, uh, and to be totally honest, I never quite heard the language used like that. I mean, they were everything. They were just sitting this talking and I was so impressed. I remember leaning over to my, my adopted mom and asking her, you know, can I know it? You know, do you understand? <laughs> well, of course, you know, and I don't know, but it, it just moved me to see the language used like that. Um, so that's why I have their pictures up here, but, but uh, the, one, uh, the one in the back, Kekewahuniaki, became a major role in my language development through the years. And um, she had made up her mind at a certain point that I could speak and understand enough language that she was never going to speak English to me again. And that's how she did it. I would go up there and we would sit for, you know, six or eight hours and it was all in the language. And in Menominee, there's a word we, we say, no sisinam, that means it. For lack of a better translation, that's over my head. You know, I don't, you know, take it easy on me. And and uh, she wouldn't say it in English. Then she would just kind of water it down to baby talk, so so that I could understand. And that's how committed she was to my language development. And I thank her with all my heart because without that, I don't think I'd become the speaker that I am today. Um, and then she did this other thing, you know. And, you know, any of you guys who have been in this, this arena for some time, you know that, you know, you have wins and unfortunately losses or ups and downs, maybe we want to call them. And I was in the midst of a major down at this time. Um, and one of my colleagues who also knew Kakewahuniaki very well, she came to me in, in the best way that she could, and she says, uh, she says, you know, you know, Ron, I'm here. Anything that you need, anything that you need, I'm willing to do to help. She said, when, you know, when Kekewahuniaki, when she was on her deathbed, she leaned in and told me, she said, you help that corn boy any way you can. She said, uh, he's going to be the one that, that takes this language. And... You, you wouldn't believe the amount of confidence that gave me. You know, I was such a, like, you know, humble guy that I didn't, I never wanted that. But when she told me that, it helped me feel like now I could take that place. I could step up and, and work that hard. So um, that's my stories about these two. And as it goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty local fella. I don't get out too much. But on occasion, I've been known to be seen other places. And 
Fortunately for me, one time I was uh, out west in the Rockies, and and uh, I was there for the for the funeral of one of their speakers, a person who also had influence in my life. And um, as as they were going through those those funeral rites for him, the person who was leading that ceremony, he made light of this one who passed, and he said, you know, he was a speaker. We don't have many speakers anymore, he said. You know, and you get you young ones, you have to you have to listen, you know, go for it. Don't be scared. And he says, you know, he says, just like our bodies, he said, in, in, in our way, our body is just a shell, right? And and in that shell, we get life through our soul, you know, our soul. And and when our shell has had enough here, our soul, it's gonna continue on, you know. He says, well, so too do our tribes, man. Each one of our tribes, it has a soul. He said, and the language is the soul of that tribe. He says, so if you let your language go, what do you have left? You have an empty shell, you know? And so that was something, another teaching that I really took to heart, man. And I hope you guys can find the same meaning in that that I did. All right, so through all of that stuff, I've, um, I've almost exclusively only been a language worker my entire adult life, you know. I've, I've had the, the fortune of being a casino worker, you know. That, that's not always that great, but I did that. Um, but other than that, almost primarily I've been either a language trainee uh, language instructor and so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what I've been able to do and so to date I've taught every every level of uh, of uh, language from birth up on through level four college um, and that's that's uh, I don't know what my next slide is here okay yeah so I've done uh, eight years as a high school teacher um, four years in the college slash university system. And I call that two years floating because I did like pretty much K-12 kind of consultation. And that's where I got my uh, elementary um, experience. But anyone in that area, man, I, I just really take my hat off to you guys. I mean, I, 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 I subbed for our kindergarten back home for four days and I got scared out of my boots, man. I, you know, when Thursday came, I was out, outside in that parking lot, like, oh my God, I made it. You know, <laughs> so anyone who thrives in that environment, you're, you're truly blessed, man. I, I don't know how else to say it. And uh, most recently, since we started our immersion program, I've been, been able to be involved in some way, shape, or form for the zero to two year olds. And, and uh, man, that is something amazing. And I can't necessarily take credit because there's a group of language warriors right now as we speak in that room with those kids and they're the real, they're the real ones putting in the work every day. So if you're that person, I really take my hat off to you, man. It's a really hard job, but you're shaping the future of your nation every day, man. And what, what would you rather be doing? Those are the, the all-stars of, of our tribes, man. So. Um, that's a little bit about my experience. Now, more recently, um, unfortunately, the, the passing of what I consider our last super fluent elder, I mean, this was the person who had, you know, the, the grammar and everything was, was just right there, um, could make new words on the fly, no hesitation. You know, he passed away in 2015, and, and unfortunately, it took that event for my tribe to really take notice to what was happening to the language. And so I say that because if he was here to help us, man, it would just be so much easier. And if you have that opportunity in your community, I hope you guys don't wait for that to happen. Um, so, so unfortunately, they're relying on me, <laughs> you know, poor guys. But uh, I've been doing the best I can for the last four years now since, since that happened. Um, it didn't take the tribe long to, to get into action and finally 
make that investment that Damien was talking about and where they said, we've got this little pocket of un, unbudgeted funds, you know, if we allocated it to a language program, do you think, do you think that we could bring our language back? And I said, yes. I didn't say I think so. You guys should have did this a year ago. I just said yes. And so for the past four years, my, my first group of trainees started January 4th, 2016. Um, and we've been on this path ever since. Oh, these are kind of backwards like me, so uh, forgive me for rewinding a little bit. But um, before that, I, I call this the hiatus, man, because I, I had a... I had a time when I was so frustrated that my tribe wasn't investing in the, in the language the way that, that it needed to happen, um, that I didn't know where else to go with it. And so I actually, like, I guess took a hiatus. I left and, and uh, I was actually hired as a CO, not a correctional officer. <laughs> But as a community organizer, you know, it was the first time that my community had done something like this, and I was pretty interested in, in uh, opportunities that it, that it had. And so I was hired as a community organizer, and I made it really clear that, that the way I seen uh, the work going was to see our, our language and culture become a prominent part of our community. So <clears throat> as a CEO, <laughs> Um, I ended up in a lot of circles where I was the only person of color, and if I wasn't, I was certainly the only native person in the room. Um, and so I'm, you know, mostly, I, I mean, I lived off the res for a couple of years when my dad was in school, but other than that, I, I live in the outskirts on the res, like not in any of the towns, and so I don't even see my neighbors. Um, so I get really... Isolated, but now when I'm out doing this, um, I, you know, I start to realize people don't even really realize we exist in some spaces, you know, today that we, we might have our language and culture and that we might even know our identity a little bit because um, some of their realities is that even if you stand there in front of them as a first language speaker, a person who, who lives as old as you may, they still don't see us today. They want, they think that we're in the past. Some people think that. Um, so it really helped me to understand that, that this importance of identity where our, our kids could stand in front of these people and, and be proud of who they are, but also show them that we are still here, you know. Um, so that, that was a rather important thing that happened during that. Um, and I also had... A, a moment of clarity, you know. So I, I mentioned that I worked in the high school for eight years, and, and uh, that was a really good job, man. In the high school, they treated me really good. And, and uh, the only thing was that even though we had a really good teacher in kindergarten, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, and a, a really good teacher in middle school, a seventh and eighth grade, and then there was myself at the high school, with all our work and the best that we could do, teaching language 30 minutes a day, um, five days a week, it was just really becoming apparent that we were never going to save the language that way. But because the high school treated me so good, I mean, they paid me good. I mean, I, uh, and there's good retirement, you know, so you kind of get cozy in that nice soft chair and, um, you know, I think I could probably do this till I retire. The, the hard truth was I knew that was never going to save our language because despite our best efforts, it just wasn't possible. Um, but I did like that comfortable chair. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what, what, what happened for me is I, I was actually, in, and this isn't a joke, I was diagnosed with cancer, you know, at 28 years old. And... and um, so what happened is they did, they did a biopsy on it, and, and uh, I'm waiting, and they tell me, you know, we're going to have results in two weeks, and, 
you know, if it's, if it's uh, this kind of cancer, it's really slow and local and you're, you're probably going to be just fine, you know, but, but if it's this other kind, it's really fast and it moves all over your body and, you know, if you've had this for a while, you might be in trouble, you know, and I knew I had it for a while, so, so uh, laying, you know, at home on the couch, I, I really had to decide if what I had done with my life was the way I wanted to be remembered. I mean, it could, that could have been it in my mind at the time. I was really in my own head about all that stuff and um, helped me to be a better father, a, a better partner, a better son, you know, and, but also made me realize that I was getting pretty complacent with where I was going with the language. Um, and that if I was going to be given another opportunity, I would do something meaningful with it. And so I, I just wanted to really talk about that because I hope that nobody in here has to have that happen to them, to wake them up and, and push them to the next level. But unfortunately, I did. And, um, but fortunately, it also was that waking moment and, and it was the slow local kind and I was able to go on and do this, what I'm doing here today. So let me share that message with you guys, man. Don't wait, wait for that call, you know. Um, push yourself to be the best you can be. <clears throat> All right, inspiration and direction. So I'm, I'm always inspired by my elders who took time to sit, teach, mentor, uh, raise heck with me and all that business. And, and the people that I teach every day, I mean, from, from all those levels that I've taught, but, but more so the, the trainees who are part of this immersion program have become really, really part of my inspiration to see them grow and flourish as, as young new speakers of the Menominee language. And Nothing, you guys, in my experience is more amazing than when you have these babies. When these babies start speaking your language, you can't buy that feeling. You can't buy that feeling. Uh, we started, we started um, with birth, you know, literally. The, the youngest age we can start with is six weeks old, and so that's what we aim to start with. And when you expose them to good language daily, these kids will never have to study, they'll never have to learn grammar charts, um, they'll never go through all the BS that we've got to endure as language learners, you know. Um, it, it just happens for them. And so we've had two moments where, where um, we've got documented sightings or hearings, you know, I don't, don't want to make it sound like that, but it's so exciting where our children, these two-year-old kids are, are putting together four word sentences, you know, in, in the language. And, and because of those of you who work in language, you understand that certain things need to happen in the grammar and whatever to, to make a good sentence. And these kids are doing that um, in, these, in these isolated spots right now. And so what more inspiration do you need than that, man? And, and I'll tell you what, the, the power that our, that our parents possess, the parents of our babies, when they post that video of their kid doing this or saying that and your nation sees that, man, a lot of that lateral oppression starts to melt away because they can say whatever they want about me. I don't care. But they, they're not going to say that about that kid. They're going to say, my grandma didn't talk like that, you know. They're going to say, wow, wow, look at that, that young baby speaking our language, you know. Um, so... So draw from that, man. That, that's, a, that's a goal worth fighting for, man, to see that language coming through at that level. You know, and, and I never got to meet this guy, man, Daryl Kitt, but any of you guys who are involved in language and, and haven't heard of him, um, uh, you know, I draw some inspiration from that guy. And he, he put together like a 42-page uh, booklet that's called Encouragement, Guidance, and Lessons Learned for native language activists and language communities. I wish you would have worked on that title a little bit, but man, you guys should go and find that because uh, that, that can really help. Uh, like it talks, when, when, put it like this, when I get a new group of trainees 
we all sit down and as we're learning the language, we read that like, just like it's in class because he sees every, all our BS that we talk about, he sees it too and he, he writes it down and he talks about it and it, it helps give us permission to be proud and permission to keep going even through a lot of that BS. So if you guys can find that, um, definitely sit down and take a look at it, man. It really, really helps. So I wanted to make sure and mention that that's a, that's a major part of, of our foundational conversations about this immersion is coming on to his work. <clears throat> Mentor programs. You know, it, it's... Uh, you know, I never seen us, like, copying anybody, you know, or, like, needing to go and take, but, man, networking has helped us steer around so many language pitfalls, um, and, and I really want to express that to you guys. I mean, we made it out to the, to the big island of Hawaii and up to, uh, up to uh, Bethel and Quig up in Alaska, and... Um, and we've, we've really got a mentor program a couple hours north of us in Waduka Dotting up at the LCO Immersion School. And um, just having these, these people to lean on, man. I mean, sometimes you hit something that for you is so tough to get over, but some of these mentor programs, they've been there. They've gone through that and they uh, can make, you know, and I really mean it, sometimes the hardest bump that you've hit as a language warrior is taken away by a, just a, a guiding statement from a, from a mentor program, someone who's been there. So I really, I really want to advocate for you guys to find networking relationships with other people doing the same work. Um, been a major part of why we've been able to get where we're at today. All right, today. <laughs> Yeah, there's my grandson right there. Um, so, today we facilitate a, uh, a birth to three language immersion daycare. Um, we started out with one room, eight students, three teachers, and right now we've, we've since grown to two rooms, um, five teachers, and 18 children, and in about a month, we're gonna add our third room, which will put us at eight teachers, uh, 24 students, and, um, you know, these are the guys, you know, they, they, these babies, um, they, they can change the world for you, and, and uh, the more you learn about language revitalization, I think everyone will be steered to work with their, with their newborns, and. It can be a, a, literally a crappy job <laughs> some days, but, um, you know, and, and even in my travels and networking, you know, people think that we're like, a, like above um, changing diapers and feeding kids. Like, do you pay someone to come in and do that? No way, man. We wouldn't have it any other way. We're, we're right in there. We're teaching those kids, and, and we're trying to do it in the most Menominee-centric way that we know how. Um, we're fortunate the guy right there, he, he was one of the first participants in, in my first immersion program, and he's been able to go on and get his linguistics degree from the University of Madison and has come back and brought a tremendous gift back to our program. And, um, so that's a little bit about that. We've got little field trips and everything for them little ones. So future story. All right, so the short-term plan for, for the way I see it is that uh, we, we really go hard on these birth, this birth to five program. And one of the reasons is the Menominee Nation is a rather small nation. We're, we're, we've got about 9,000 members, maybe about 3,000 of them live at home on the reservation. Um, and I guess just to be blunt, we don't have a lot of folks to draw from when you start building an educational facility. We don't have people who, A, speak the language very proficiently, and B, have that state certification or that degree to be able to go in and do that. Um, and so as part of our immersion trainee program, we also move to certify 
our trainees as, uh, it's called a Child Development Associates or CDA, something that they are able to attain in one semester at college. And that certifies them for birth to two. Um, and then we can work on the rest as it happens. And so the short-term plan, mo mostly limited by that, we don't have that educational capacity to serve the older grades. Um, we can actually get into immersion without having to you know, wait four years or, or anything like that. So we've been able to do that. Um, however, the long-term plan obviously is, is to charter an immersion school and when, when I get back home on, on Thursday, we're gonna be uh, heading up, up to actually start our, our foundational charter school development conversations and, and be trying to move to seek some some uh, chartering authorizers and so so we really see this uh, this whatever we're fostering here this language revitalization um, we, we really want to see it as a long-term solution and and I think in our communities you know I, I don't want to speak just for Menominee because I think this is a shared thing we we're, we're fighting a lot of things man uh, a lot of things in our communities that that aren't positive and I firmly believe that language is the key to everything. It was for me. I mean, I was not on a good path for a while, but, but this is what's always kept me um, true to who I am. And I believe that if we share this gift with the youth of our nation, they're going to be so much better than we are. Um, we just have to make sure and get it to them in the best way that we can. And so as, as um, immersion programs grow, it's... Uh, it's kind of tough to decide where to go or, you know, first people want to say like, what level are you at? Or, you know, so-and-so is fluent and we don't really, don't really know what that means. And this is something that directly comes out of a mentor program that has been able to help me understand what the next step is for us. And um, OPI or, or oral proficiency interviews um, are like really intelligently designed conversations that are designed to tease out your abilities and inabilities. And as speakers, we, you know, maybe some of us don't like that, but, but when you actually have a, a comprehensive OPI that helps you to understand where you need to get better as a speaker, that is a powerful tool. And, and uh, it's something you know that just because you endeavor to do it, it doesn't mean now you have the answer. Like we, for example, we did our first OPI and we learned more about how to do it better than we did about any speaker. So um, we recognize that it's a process as well. But when you have a solid OPI, you can really help your speakers to gain ne the next level of proficiency or get over that next uh, language plateau, so to speak. So I'm a big, big proponent of the OPIs and, and language immersion programs. <clears throat> and data collection, you know, that's uh, something that I'm obviously not the, the um, guru in, but we're really excited about the opportunity to see these children be raised with the language, and we're certainly documenting um, everything that we can because we don't know how to do it, right? We're, we're basically, we're taking uh, any, any language cues, any comprehension cues, um, any... You know, if, you're, if your kids know that they should put tobacco down before they do something, these, you know, you want to document that because that's something that isn't happening in the early childhood facility next to them. So all of these things, you know, we want to we wanna understand this. So in the same way that an OPI can help your language, um, that this data can help guide us in the future. So, let me see where I'm at. Okay. So we also see language as a, as a, as a multi-generational process and as an intergenerational process. And I really like that because in our revitalization efforts, um, we wear a heavy burden to, um, to revitalize our language to be the best that we can be. Um, but, but what, what is more powerful is we see 
you know, it's a common theme in Indian country. We talk about intergenerational trauma. What happens when we turn that around and we have, we have this intergenerational awakening, this intergenerational revitalization? Man, that's powerful. And, and so I, I really try not to dictate or guide where this thing is going to go because I think that as this becomes a multi-generational and intergenerational process, that the children of the children we're teaching, if they're still being raised, if they're raised first language fluent in their homes by their parents, those kids are just gonna know things about themselves that we could have never taught them just by way of presenting good language to them on a daily basis. Um, and so I, I think that if we can be cognizant of that, we, we wanna, um, you know, strategically plan, and, and that's all important, man, because it helps put a roadmap down, but to not define that future because these kids have the potential to be so much more than we ever could be. Um, so just to keep that in mind as you're going through your revitalization process. And I think that's, yeah. So um, with that, man, I hope you guys found something in, in my story that, that maybe um, is relevant to your journey as well, and, and maybe you guys know a lot of this stuff, but you know, the, the language, let the language guide what you do, and I, I just want to share a, a really short story about um, one of our trips to Hawaii, and, and that's what really got me to, to the place where, you know, I, I use that theme of language is the key to everything. You know, these guys had, uh, we were on side of a beach, and these Hawaiians were showing us that they're, they're re, reintroducing their fish gardens, you know, and, and I, I don't, whatever, we got like hatcheries or whatever, but I guess when it's done in a natural way, they, their people have always done this um, on the shores of, of their, the ocean, but it's a place where fresh water meets salt water and, and certain things have to happen to create that that uh, pH level and or whatever thing these, the fish need to survive. And so they had known that their ancestors did this. And they could even remember the word for it. But when they were doing it, they couldn't get it to work. Um, seems simple. Put in next fresh water, put the fish in, feed them once in a while, and, you know, we got fish gardens. But it's a lot more um, detailed than that. And so what's happening is Hawaiians now, they've been in this revitalization effort since 1982. You know, so they're getting pretty close to 40 years in. And these guys are now being able to take their language and understand it, not just on a morphonomic level, but they're starting to understand what, what the meaning of each syllable has in their language. And so as they're starting to understand it on this kind of level, that word that they have for fish garden actually right in the word taught them how to do it again. And that's a revelation for me that gives me so much hope for the future and that in many of our communities we think or feel that we've lost so much. But if we do a good job of bringing our languages back the best way we can, maybe our children will learn to read the DNA signatures in our languages. I want to say about that much, Natanaway Makanuk, innate.